Mark Wafer is a Tim Hortons franchisee in the Toronto area. Mark is more than just an advocate for people with disabilities. He puts his advocacy where his hiring policies are. So joining us now to tell us about his efforts and what business can learn from them, here's Mark Wafer. Nice to have you here at TVO tonight. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. Uh, Mark, people won't know this, obviously, so let's bring them in on it. You're deaf. I am. How much of what I'm saying can you hear? Uh, approximately 20%. 20%. So 80... I, was, I was born deaf uh, with about 25% of my hearing, and uh, today I have about 20%. Do you wear hearing aids? No, I don't. I did when I was a kid going to school. Uh, hearing aids don't work for me. Uh, my hearing is, uh, is a nerve-based deafness, and uh, hearing aids tend to increase basically what I already hear. Uh, but uh, I really uh, should, should be wearing a, a cochlear implant. But I do fine. As long as I can see somebody and I'm looking at them, I, I do great. Well, you're reading, I, 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 you're hearing some of what I'm saying, but I gather you're reading my lips as well. Is that Absolutely, right? Absolutely, I am, yes. You're really good at lip reading. I am. <laughs> <laughs> how mu can you put a sort of a percentage on how much of your understanding comes from reading lips as opposed to hearing what little bit you can? I'd say 50-50. 50-50. It's about half and half, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back. How difficult was it, given... First of all, I should ask, do you consider yourself to be disabled? Uh, well, it depends on how you look at it. I, I don't consider myself a disabled person. But, uh, you know, being 80% deaf, let's face it, it is a disability. It is a disability. Yeah, so, I mean, the barriers that people with disabilities face, I faced them. So that's what I want to know about. When you had to, I guess some couple decades ago, when you had to get your first job, how was that, given the deafness you had to deal with? Uh, it wasn't necessarily difficult for me to find a job. Um, I was very good at um, selling myself. I was very good at, uh, you know, I'm Irish, Irish background, so I could make up some stories that actually worked really well for me. My problem was keeping a job. So I was able to get in, um, for example, working in a grocery store as a buggy boy. But as soon as the announcement came across uh, the store for the buggy boy to go up to the parking lot, of course, I wouldn't go, and uh, I'd lose my job. So I, I, did, I, was, I had a very hard time keeping a job as a young man. Was that buggy boy job your first job? Yeah, it was, yeah. That was. Yes. And surely that when they hired you, they knew you were deaf, and an announcement over a public address system was not going to be adequate. Why didn't they figure that out? Well, that was pretty typical of the time. Uh, people who were deaf or had other types of disabilities faced enormous barriers. This was back in the 70s. So uh, faced enormous barriers. Those barriers are still there today, not as significant, but uh, back in those days, there was no, certainly no level playing field. Hmm. Do you know how to sign? I know some signing, but I don't use it. How come? Well, I felt that, uh, and, and of course, this goes back to when I was in high school. My, I, did, I did at one point uh, get sent to a school for the deaf, and the first thing they teach you there is how to sign. Uh, my mother wasn't very happy with that. She said, I don't want you signing because you can hear some. A signing is a great form of communication for people who need it. But for those who don't really need it, it can become uh, another type of disability because you're only communicating with people who can sign. Mm -hmm. So I've done very well in life not signing. Um, and, uh, and so it's worked for me. But si signing is extremely important for those who need it. Let's talk about how you have done well, because you're in the Tim Hortons line of work now, aren't you? That's right. How many stores do you own? Seven. And where are they? Six of them are in the Scarborough area. One of them is on Mount Pleasant Avenue in, in, uh, in uptown Toronto. How'd you get into this? Well, it's actually an interesting story. Uh, my wife is an accountant, and she was working for the corporation. I was in the automotive business, and uh, we'd actually thought about buying our own car dealership uh, about 25 years ago. And an opportunity came along to buy a Tim Hortons. We hadn't even thought about it at the time, but because my wife was working for Tim Hortons Corporate and on the inside, we saw that it was uh, something good to do, so we did. We bought our first store 20 years ago. 20 built, years ago. For how much? built the empire from there. How so. much money did it cost to buy that first franchise? Back in those days, I think it was somewhere around $200,000, which to me was a, was a small, not small fortune, <laughs> big fortune. Did you have that much money? Just. Just, only just, because you, you didn't have to have the whole amount. You could borrow some of it from a bank, but I just had enough money. So you did have to go to the bank and get a loan? Absolutely. How challenging was that, again, given that you have a deafness issue? Was that a problem for the bank? No, that, that's never been an issue, an issue for me. Um, 
uh, and of course the, the, the power of the Tim Hortons brand. Uh, when you go to a bank looking for money to buy at Tim Hortons, uh, they were falling over each other trying to, trying to help you. Hmm. Uh, but no, I've never had that type of barrier. I, I have heard from other people who try to get into business for themselves. Uh, people who have disabilities who self-advocate Many of them do go into business for themselves because they can't find a job, mm -hmm. and they do have difficulty finding uh, uh, resources for banking was capital. It, was it your plan when you started purchasing Tim Hortons franchises to kind of be an example and hire people with disabilities to show the rest of the world, look, it can be done? No. That wasn't the plan? Absolutely not. So how yeah. did that become the plan? It became a plan out of need, out of my first week. Uh, when we opened our first store in Scarborough, it was a large store. It had 65 seats, um, large dining room. And very quickly, I realized that my staff, the existing staff, couldn't keep, up, couldn't keep up with the dishes, the tables, the dishwasher, dining room, and so on. So I had a need. So I put an ad on the door and uh, basically said, uh, dining room attendant needed. And then walked a young man who had Down syndrome. Is this Look, Cliff? He was, this was Clint. Clint, was Clint. okay. Mm -hmm. Looking for his first job. He just graduated from high school. He was uh, about 21 years old at the time. And um, I, didn't ha I didn't have a lot of experience being around people uh, with intellectual disabilities at the time, but I thought, I'm going to give Clint a chance. And the reason I did that is because I knew that if Clint was walking down the street looking for a job, nobody was going to hire him. And I knew it was just going to be uh, very, very difficult for him. So I gave him an opportunity to, 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 to work. But I didn't have a lot of time. I'm already working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to get my business off the ground. So I enlisted the help of a local uh, community agency, Community Living Toronto, where fantastic job coaches. They came out and they helped me to train Clint. And Clint needed to learn how to take a bus. Uh, it wasn't just learning how to do the job. He needed to learn how to get to work, how to go home. But after about two weeks uh, and Clint was on the job, I learned very quickly, this, this guy was my best employee. Your best employer. Best employer. Why? By far. Came to work early, work, wanted to work during breaks, uh, go home. Uh, he didn't want to go home. They didn't want to take his vacation. <laughs> they didn't want to take days off. And we actually had a rule in our stores that uh, people, uh, employees did not wear their uniform to work so that it wouldn't be contaminated while they were working in the food industry. We had to make an exception for Clint because he was so proud of his Tim Horton uniform. Uh, he had to wear it on the bus to show everybody that he worked at Tim Horton. Wanted to wear it all the time. Yeah, and when he wasn't working, when he was at home with friends, family, events, Christmas, whatever, that's all he talked about was the job he had at Tim Horton because it, you know, it, it just meant so much to him. Hmm. And so he became our best employer, and that's the reason why we started. You know, we had so much success with Clint. As the business grew, we continued to uh, hire people with intellectual disabilities and then eventually all, all types of disabilities. How many do you think you've hired over the years? Almost 100. 100 people 100, with disabilities. Yes, yeah. we, we have, uh, and this is just known disabilities, because we, we become known for hiring people with disabilities, so we know that there's some people with invisible disabilities who have come to work for us for that reason uh, that we may not know of. But uh, we have, um, uh, we know for sure we've hired 94, mm -hmm. and 42 people with a disability currently, hire, currently work for us. Uh, out of a workforce of 250. Did you ever have to fire anybody because it didn't work out? Absolutely. And Absolutely. give me an example of what happened. Well, actually, just recently we fired a young lady with an intellectual disability who was stealing money. Ooh. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the rules don't change just because the person has a disability. Um, uh, we follow the same standards as we would for somebody without a disability who, who, uh, who needs to be removed from the workplace. Hmm. The, the good thing, though, is that if you, if you have hired somebody with an intellectual disability and you've made that decision that this is not working out, that you need them to be removed, you can go back to the agency that you're using and say, hey, listen, I need some help. I need you to come out here and help me. I've got a problem here. I've made the decision that they're going to leave, and the agency will find them work elsewhere. Whereas if the person doesn't have a disability, you fire them and you don't think twice about it. Mm -hmm. The unemployment rate, I guess, for so-called able-bodied people in Ontario these days is, you know, seven-ish percent. That's right. What do you think it is for people with disabilities? Extremely high. Extremely high. Um, if you look at uh, uh, HRSDC, Stats Canada, you're looking at anywhere from 25 to 50 percent, depending on, on how we, we calculate it. 
what we know for sure is the participation rate for people with disabilities is extremely low. Uh, some anecdotal statistics show an unemployment rate for people with disabilities as high as 70 percent because you've got to calculate those who um, are not participating in the workforce, mm -hmm. um, who can't participate in the workforce, but also those who have just given up out of sh sheer frustration. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I, I, I've heard stories of people putting out a thousand applications in five years and not getting a single interview. So, It's worked out for you. Yes. Um, do you think there's a formula here that can be exported to other businesses? Absolutely do it. If you look at why the, the unemployment rate is so high, it's because businesses are buying into a series of myths and misperceptions that if they hire somebody with a disability, they'll take more time off, productivity will be lower, safety will be worse off, uh, innovation won't be uh, as good, um, and turnover, of course, uh, will, be, will be an issue. And we know for sure that the opposite of those is, is, is true. And if you look at my business and you take a look at turnover, just simply turnover, uh, the QSR business, the quick service restaurant business in the, in the GTA has an annual turnover rate of somewhere between 60 to 90 percent, depending on the locations. Hmm. And in downtown Toronto, it's even higher because there's a transient nature to people who are working in a quick service restaurant. So these are people who are working for you for months, not years, probably. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, my turnover rate is 38 percent. Now, the average, the average tenure of a person who is working for me who does not have a disability is a, is a year and three months to a year and four months. But a person who has a disability who works for me, their average tenure is seven years. Seven years? Seven years. So it's in your interest to make that happen because you're Absolutely. doing a lot less hiring and firing. Absolutely. And huh. there's huge costs associated with that, Steve. If you look at uh, the person who poured your coffee this morning uh, at Tim Hortons, $4,000 to replace that person. You know, when you consider interviewing, hiring, training. There's a tremendous amount of uh, training these days uh, at a Tim Hortons uh, for those entry-level level positions. Uh, lost productivity of a new employee, uh, new uniforms for a new employee. I mean, you've, got, you've got almost $4,000 in cost associated with a new hire. So if my turnover is 38% versus uh, my colleagues at the typical 30, 75%, then it's in my benefit uh, financially or not to my bottom line. Absolutely. Let's uh, read an excerpt from a report here. This is a report from the Panel on Labor Market Opportunities for Persons with Disabilities. It came out last year. I'll read a short excerpt from it. There is a business case for employing people with disabilities. This is good news for employers seeking talent and for the approximately 795,000 working age Canadians who are not working but whose disability does not prevent them from doing so. Almost half, 340,000 of these people, have post-secondary education. I bet people don't know that. Very few people are aware of that. I'll tell you something else that people are unaware of, and that is that in Ontario alone, today there are 43,000 post-secondary education students who have a disability, and that's grown at 15% a year. So all of those numbers that, you, that you've just listed and what I've just said is one of the highest in the world. We have one of the highest, best trained and educated uh, demographic of people with disabilities uh, who are ready to get into the workforce. And yet, my hunch is, this stereotype persists that it's too much of a risk or it's too scary to bring disabled people into the workplace because, well, if we're an employer, we don't know if they can get along with their able-bodied fellow employees, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What's your experience been with that? Uh, that's exactly the experience. That, you know, the, 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 the number one barrier to, to uh, disability employment and inclusion is fear, uh, fear of the unknown. Uh, CEOs quite, quite often say to me, you know, Mark, what do I do if it doesn't work out? Well, the answer is very simple. If it doesn't work out, you replace your employee. It's like we were with somebody who's not disabled. But uh, that, that fear uh, persists. It's also the fear of litigation. So if you do let somebody go who has a disability, uh, they will go to the Human Rights Commission. Absolutely false. That is not true at all. That's not happening. Has it happened to you? It's never happened to me. Never happened? Never happened to me. And how many disabled employees do you think you've had to fire over the years? Uh, well, I've got 50 of them who are no longer working with me. I would say probably 20% of those I, I have fired. And no one has challenged you at the Human Rights Tribunal? No, because I've fired them for, for just reasons. Uh, I've given them 
have given them ample opportunity to increase their performance. If they do something wrong, like, for example, stealing money, mm -hmm. it, that's it. It's done. Right. But if the performance uh, needs to be improved, we give them every opportunity to improve. We write them up. And if it's not working out and if it's uh, an intellectual disability, we might have the agency come back in and help us. But at some point in time, you've got to say, this is not working out for my business. Hmm. So it's time to cut. April is Autism Awareness, Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I wanted to ask you if you have any employees who've got autism working for you. Yes, I do. I have, uh, right now, I have four people with autism. At the various store, uh, not all at one store. Not at one store, no, all in different stores. Different stores. Yeah. Uh, can you give me an example of the kind of work one of your autistic employees might do? Uh, well, I have one uh, person with autism who is um, who was hired as a customer service uh, representative and is now working in one of my drive-throughs, one of my busiest stores, working in my drive-thru. Uh, for that individual, uh, the training was a little bit longer. Um, he did not tell us that he had autism when he first started with us, but he is at the higher end of the spectrum. So very high functioning. High functioning, and he's doing a, a, a fantastic job. He had difficulty with uh, understanding time, and so it would show up for his shift late. Uh, but once we, we, we got through that and he understood, um, he became a, a, a great asset to the company. Uh, the other three people we have working with autism uh, are working entry-level positions. So they're looking after dining rooms, and one of them is looking after a very large parking lot in one of our, one of our stores. The interesting thing is one of my uh, employees with autism, who's been with me for six months, six, sorry, six years, uh, has had two promotions in the six years. She started off uh, working uh, in a dining room, doing the same job that Clint would be doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but very quickly, we realized she was capable of more. Is that Tanya? That's Tanya. That's Tanya. And, it's, and, and, it's, and it's, it's one of the things I've learned about working with people with disabilities is that when they come on board, you always do a sort of litmus test. You think you know what their capabilities are. But it's not until you give them that opportunity to, to stand on their own two feet. They're away from their parents for the first time. They're away from school. They're away from the stakeholder groups and the social service agencies. They've got a boss. There's expectations. And you, you see them shine. Of the 94 people I hired with a disability, I can guarantee you I was wrong 94 times about their capabilities in the job. And Me in the meaning you thought their capabilities... I thought their capabilities would not be as good as what they were. As what they turned out to That's be. That's right. Absolutely. What about this, just to follow up on the fear thing you mentioned a minute ago, an, employee, an employer wants all of his employees or her employees to seamlessly work together as a team. That's right. Does that happen when you have disabled and able-bodied people working together or people who may have intellectual disabilities? Because the, the assumption or the fear would be that that's harder. It's actually easier. Um, what, what we found is that by hiring people with disabilities, you're changing the culture of your workforce. You have an inclusive workforce, so you're changing the culture of the workforce, especially for those without disabilities. And we see that now. Uh, we get applications from people who say, you know, Mark, are you the Tim Horton franchisee who hires people with disabilities? And I say, yes, I am. You'd like to apply. What is your disability? And they say, well, I don't have one. But I want to work here because you do hire people with disabilities. So what it does is it changes the culture of the workforce. And if you look at my turnover rate for people who don't have disabilities, it's much lower than the average uh, for the QSI industry. So it has a very profound impact on those people. Uh, what, we, what we think it is is uh, people who don't have a disability might think, well, if the company is looking after those people, perhaps I'll be looked after as well. Hmm. So it has that, it has that effect on, on uh, other employees. My employees uh, look out for each other, but my non-disabled employees don't necessarily look out for my disabled employees. My wife was in one of my stores the other day, and she came to me and she said, Mark, do you realize that the disabled employee was looking out for the non-disabled employee <laughs> in the kitchen? And I thought, yeah, that's, that's pretty typical. Everybody looks out for everybody. That's right. Have you ever had, for lack of a better way to describe it, an incident in one of your, friend, one of your stores uh, because of somebody's disability? Uh, I, there have been very few. Um, we, we have had issues related to, the, to a disability uh, where a person may uh, have a productivity issue, for example, uh, may uh, have had a behavior change. 
usually with somebody who has an intellectual disability. And my, myself, myself and my staff, my managers, are not experts on, on disabilities. So We're experts do, on coffee and donuts. <laughs> so how do you handle that when that happens? So what we do is bring the agency back in. We go to the agency and say, listen, we've got, a, we've got an issue here. We did have one example where uh, one of our employees uh, who'd been with us for 10 years at this point uh, became very aggressive. Hmm. And uh, it turned out she had a medical problem, medical issue, which required surgery. Um, the agency came in, found it, got, to, got her to a doctor, and uh, she's now back at work and doing a great job. So. Yeah. Have you tried to bring these hiring practices to the whole Tim Hortons family of restaurants, if you like? Yes, I have. How's that going? Good. We have, uh, in Ontario, we have uh, more than 400 stores that have hired at least one person with a disability. Uh, Tim Hortons Corporate, uh, you know, it's, Tim Hortons uh, Corporation is, a, is um, a very large corporation. It's very similar to other corporations in Canada in that, you know, they, they tend to buy into the myths and misperceptions, which is, which is expected. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do to change the mindset of Canadian corporation. What Tim Hortons Corporate has done an exceptional job with is in working with uh, accessibility and understanding the, 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 the business case for accessibility, understanding that if we have accessible stores and well-trained staff, uh, that people with disabilities as customers will walk into our stores or come in in a wheelchair and, and will be treated with the dignity uh, that they deserve. And it's a business case. The more customers we get in our stores, the more money we make. I guess right. this is the key point. You're not doing this out of charity. This That's is, right. you're making a business case. That's exactly what it is. Do you ever receive any complaints from people who want to work from you, who work for you, um, say able-bodied so-called people, mm. that you're actually favoring disabled people with your employment practices over us? You ever no, get that? No, because I'm not. I'm not favoring anybody with a, with a, with a disability. My, uh, when, I, when I hire somebody, uh, let's say, for example, I'm hiring a baker. I might get 10 applications that I consider to be worthwhile. My managers will sit down and look at them. Uh, two people may have a disability. I hire the best person for that job. I'm in business to make money. I'm not there to, to run a charity. What I will do is if I, find that, if I find that somebody with a disability is equal to somebody without a disability, I may hire the person with a disability simply because I know it will be very difficult for them to find a job elsewhere based on the statistics. But I'm looking for the best possible employee at all times. Any complaints from customers that they don't like dealing with disabled employees? <laughs> the opposite. The opposite. Customers love it. Customers love it. Customers quite often tell me that they come to my business uh, because we hire the fabric of the community. If you look at the number of people in the community who have somebody close to them who has a disability, we're talking mom, dad, brother, sister, son or daughter. 53% of us have someone who has a disability. Mm -hmm. So it's close to half the population. And so for that reason, people with disabilities will go out of their way. People, uh, sorry, uh, customers will go out of their way to visit a retail outlet that hires people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. In 20 years, I've never had a negative, never, never had a negative comment from anybody regarding an employee with a disability. In which case, um in our last minute here, what do you think it's going to take for the broader society to get over the fear that you talked about earlier, that this is not controversial, good for business, easier than you think it's going to be? Yeah. How do you get that out there? Education and employer engagement. And this is one of the things I do uh, on, on a regular basis now. I speak to other employers, uh, usually in large groups, uh, dispel the myths talk to them about that risk and get them to understand that there is no downside to being an inclusive employer. Do they believe you when you make that pitch? When we talk about bottom line, they definitely they do. do. They do. Because I bet they're skeptical when they walk into that meeting. They do. Because when we talk about it from a social service point of view, or we talk about it from, uh, you know, the heartstrings, uh, no, they're not going to get it. But when you talk to other employers about the bottom line, about low turnover, about better safety, about higher innovation, you're hitting on a touch point that they, t they hear all day long from their business managers. And so that's how we make a difference. Mark, it's awfully good of you to come into TVO tonight and share your stories with us. Thank Great. you very much. Good Thank to you. meet you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.